Hi everyone, today is September 28th, 2019, and this is the Duel Assessment, your podcast for Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links. My name is Green Ranger, and this is a very big week in Duel Links, the arrival of the new DSOD world, and whenever Konami does this, this is pretty much, they throw in everything, there's a new box, uh, Chaos Dimension, I think it's called, um, what's it called? Dark Dimension, okay, there's a lot of Chaos cards in it. But anyways, a new box, Dark Dimension. Uh, we're going to talk about the URs and SRs of this box. There is a new structure deck, Master of Chaos. A bunch of new cards here that kind of fall fit really well together. Um, we have various things going on. Doug Dimidul has a Gravekeeper's deck for his casual deck of the week. So check him out later. See what he does with all the new and old Gravekeeper's cards. We have upcoming news of um, released this morning of uh, mid-October and late early October and all those things. Um, and also a new interesting update for the future. Um, okay, so... Um, thanks for all the new listeners and followers on Twitter. Um, we recently got a lot of followers, so uh, thank you very much. And this this episode's a little different. We're going to reformat the the way that the beginning is just because there's this massive shift. But we're not going to be talking about esports this week, but we're going to just go around Twitter and talk about uh, various discussions I've had. So, as usual in the beginning, my de- my week in Duel World... I actually hit King of Games last month. I closed out the last season, I mean, the last old meta in, with King of Games, and really how it worked was I just played Fortune Lady through Legend. Um, you know, if you listened in previous weeks, I was playing Nordics for some reason, and that got me through, uh, through the Platinum ranks, and I got to Legend. And then I decided to hit King of Games. I bought the Fortune Lady cards, um... You know, knowing now that the new cards are out, uh, new, much more exciting cards are out, I may have, you know, just punted this season or something. Uh, but I, I really, I did want to play Fortune Ladies, and I bought enough of that box to get some cards. And really what you need to play Fortune Ladies are two cards. That's Fortune Lady Past as a tuner, and then... Fortune Lady Calling is just a general good card. Um, when I was buying through the box, I started playing the deck once I got two Fortune Lady Callings and three Fortune Lady Passed. I think I got the two Callings before the, the three Passed. Um, so once I got that card, I started going. And you know, just building the deck, I was looking through uh, some of the de- the decks that hit King of Games. And I noticed that there were some common themes... They all ran Time Passage, which gives you three stars on your Fortune Lady to help a synchro play. And that's pretty core to the deck. So to build the deck, um, one Fortune Lady Light. This is a card, frankly, I didn't use too much. There's a combo potential where you get to special summon a Fortune Lady when you banish this card. Um, with Fortune Lady Passed, I believe. But I frankly didn't use this combo too much. There's two Fortune Lady wins here. Fortune Lady wins very important because um, she's the main uh, f- material for Fortune Lady every. You get passed out, and then you get wind out, and then you increase the level by three. So one plus three plus three is seven. So that's, she's really the, the linchpin here. She's really important for the, the Synchro Summon as well as the back row control. So with her... It's sometimes decent just to play her when your opponent has one back row, so you could take out that that back row. So, um, and it's notable for her if you have two fortune ladies and they have one back row, it's not going to hit that one back row because they count two. So you have to have the exact number of fortune ladies out when you're hitting the back row. But she's very important just because of the math and her role. Uh, three fortune lady pass, of course. This is your only tuner. This card also has the ability to banish the spellcaster. And then you increase the level. Um, I did this on occasion, but I didn't go crazy with it. I just really stuck to the 1 plus 3 plus 3 play. Um, I mean, occasionally I did um, get into my other synchro plays, but um, that's pretty much what I did with her. 
Fortune Lady Water is the level 4. There's two copies of this card, and this is the one that you would just uh, summon with Fortune Lady Calling to get card advantage. You draw two cards, so that's what uh, she's for. And uh, her four stars kind of line up with some math, too. Four plus one. If you have passed in water, you can get Armodities out. Um, other things you could do, too. You could banish her, add four stars to your Fortune Lady Pass to increase... Um, the bigger synchro plays. Now, in terms, those are all the monsters I have there. I have two copies of Fortune Lady Calling. I mean, every deck that's playing Fortune Ladies wants three. It's it's a no brainer. But I got King of Games with two, so you know when you're on a budget and or don't want to spend too much. Um, I didn't spend anything on this deck. I just I just played gems. I just used my gems, and um, you could do it with two. And one copy of Fortune Vision. This is Carly's level 35. And pretty good card again. This one, this card helps you get a Fortune Lady Calling. Tutor that straight from the deck. And then there's various protection abilities when you uh, banish monsters with Fortune Lady Every, for example. And the other cards are what you get to play around with. And what I chose, I just, I just looked around and I thought... You know, certain cards were good against the meta, and certain cards were just general good cards. I have one copy of Cosmic Cyclone. I've always liked Cosmic Cyclone a lot. Um, you know, there's various cards you can use to um, lock down the back row, but Cosmic Cyclone and Banish is pretty good. Two copies of Econ. Econ is very good in Fortune Ladies. Uh, sometimes you get Fortune Lady every out, and then they get some big... Monsters, I'm I'm talking about Dark Lords here, and the right play would be Econ Take. Sometimes you Econ Take their biggest guy, who is probably the uh, Superbia, maybe. And you leave it in attack mode, and they don't want to destroy their monster, or they can't destroy their monster. And then you get Fortune Lady Every back. She gets over the Dark Lords because she increases her level. And then she banishes a Dark Lord, and then you win the board right there. So... Uh, Econ Take is a very good play in Fortune Ladies. Uh, three copies of Paleozoic Canadia. Uh, Paleozoic Canadia is just just a good card. And the monsters that come out are level 2, so that kind of helps you get more synchro plays. I have one copy of Bending Destiny, and this is one of the MVPs in the deck, I think. Um, they only give you one copy, but it's a counter trap. And, you know, you just... You could just end their... You could negate their back row, or you could just bounce that normal summon back so you just have another turn. Uh, tech choice here. Shadow Imprisoning Mirror. This card single-handedly beats uh, Desperado, Dark Lords, you know, any dark deck. This single-handedly beats it. It was very clutch. It does lock out your Fortune Lady Past's ability, but I hardly use that ability anyways. And then I, I ended the deck with Wall of D. I just noticed a lot of people were just swinging in with their full board. You know, that was just nonstop, so Wall of D. And um, a lot of Fortune Lady decks had uh, Drowning Mirror Force, but I don't have that card. So I, that's what I did with the back row. Extra deck, one copy of Sc Scrap Dragons, a level 8. Um, I may have used this card a few times, but I definitely didn't rely on it a ton. One copy of Black Rose Dragon. There are definitely situations where you have to use Black Rose Dragon. When you see your opponent spend all of their cards and they have nothing left in the hand, you blow up the board and then you win by card advantage. And it's a level 7, of course, which fits in well. Arcanite Magician is another level 7. I use this card like once or twice. And there are situations where you say, oh, okay, if I, if I take out these two cards, I win the game. It's kind of like a card advantage thing, too, with... Uh, Black Rose Dragon. Hermodides, 1 plus 4. Um, pretty good against you Bell decks. I think that's pretty much the use of Hermodides in, in general. One copy of Star Eater. I won a few games of Star Eater. It's level 11, but um, when you have to get over some really big guys, and you... It's it's like Hermodides. You you get around... It does. It's summon can't be disrupted, but... Um, yeah, it just wins certain games against big monsters. And then the main... The 
the, the synchro summon play you try to get into every game. Fortunately, the every I only have one copy of this one in the deck. I I own five of these, but a lot of decks run two. But because she can get herself back every turn, um, I don't see I didn't see a point of getting um of putting two copies into the extra deck because she can come back every turn, and the every turn banish is great. And she gets she herself will get over three thousand attack monster in one turn, so it's all there. And that's a deck. That's my deck of the week. Um, my my week in dual world. And um, I'm not sure how the deck will fare in this new meta, but I got my king of games. And outside of that, once DSOD world hit, I switched over and started playing Nordics because I found out. Um, to unlock a character, you have to banish a hundred times. So, I have a Nordic deck with uh, Mara, the Nordic Alphar, in the, which helps to play into Crystron Quadrant Gandrix, which could banish three cards a turn. So, I'm trying this Turbo Quad Nordic deck on Auto Duel, and I'm ranking up my characters as well. So that is my week in Dual World. As mentioned, this is a bit of a different week in this podcast in that we are taking a break from esports. I personally don't see a point in discussing e- esports at this very moment because the massive influx of cards on Thursday, and we are in a really unsettled meta. The, the tier list is probably unknown unless we collect more data, which means playing more tournaments. So, um,. Normally, in this time, we would discuss, you know, Duel Links Meta Weeklies, other I- interesting tournaments I find with cool deck lists and the Duel Links Meta tier list, of course, but that is all in the air. And we have this Just Chatting segment on Twitter. Just Chatting is just stolen from Twitch when when streamers just or just want to be on cam. But um, these are just some of the interactions or some of the tweets that I found very interesting during the week before. Most of these were before... Um, DSOD world hit because everyone just stopped uh, everyone just started playing the game after that but um, I tweeted something I saw that um, Konami had a notification about um, Jaden Ubel skill and if you don't have the character it's a little confusing and um, I tweeted it appears the English translator at Konami went on vacation or something and deck tech the old uh Guy on this podcast, an extreme poppy 0642, like the tweet. If I was funny, um, yeah, I mean, it's always funny. It's not funny, funny to make fun of people who, uh, who struggle with English, but um, I just find it funny that they released it in the game kind of officially with a tweet like that. That the English is all messed up completely and they didn't really care about it, but um, that's all that is. Um, my King of Games deck, I posted the Fortune Lady deck. I say free to play, by the way. Who says you need three Fortune Lady for King of Games? Also, King of Games doesn't mean much anymore. And this sparked some discussion. Nasser Al Masafri says, Congrats. A pro Bench Warmer, who has his own podcast, Duelist Inner Monologue, says, Something like an ELO system once in King of Games or a worldwide rank needs to be put in place for me to really care about King of Games. And um, he also says, I get ranked being casual friendly and thus the real reason for the difference, but it makes the ranks you achieve kind of meaningless. The L game says, you only need one. The person who got number one in Kyber Cub used one. And I agree, King of Games means nothing anymore and doesn't feel great. Yeah. The, the core of my Fortune Lady deck was based on the guy who got number one, and that's kind of why the reason why I played the deck. Anyways, um, let's see. It's Bradaz HD. Uh, uh, guy on YouTube it says, it, doesn't, it really doesn't feel like the DSOD world is just over 30 hours away. I don't see any, I don't see or feel any hype for it anywhere. And, um... I felt the same way, actually. I f- like they're releasing this whole thing on dual, uh, a whole new update, and barely anyone talked about dual links. I think that's the that's my feeling in general. And we as a community care about it a lot, but um, 
it doesn't get a lot of press compared to other games. Everyone knows what Fortnite is. Everyone knows what uh, this game is, but not a lot of people know about Duel Links. Pro Bench Warmer says, I'm not hype at all. Brutal Rampage 69 also says, because it honestly could have been an event rather than a whole, than a world, world in my opinion, there's not enough content to be hyped about. And this podcast tweet, no podcast question of the week. Feel free to shout out here. Doug Dimidul, Yu-Gi-Oh! Deck Talk says, I'd like to give a shout out to Green Ranger for hitting King, King of Games. That is all. Thanks a lot, Doug. Ruxin34 says, thanks for having me on way back when. Yes, um, I had an interview with Ruxin and um, he's back playing Duel Links. Ben Harrier says, thank you for all you've done consistent, consistently releasing this lovely podcast, even in the darkest of times. You've always been a delight to listen to. Thank you a lot. Grand Harrier was our longtime Patreon and fan of this podcast. And, um, you know, I'm a person who goes through certain things. I don't, um, I'm not ashamed to say that I have emotional problems. And sometimes a distraction from the everyday, either whether it's your own emotional problems or politics or depressing news of the world, you need an escape. And this, you know, people listen to the podcast for that and they play this game, Duel Links. Duel Links is a great escape. I found it to be a great escape from uh, the hard pressures of the world. Um, so, yeah. Glad to be of service there. Pro Benchwarmer is thinking about doing a question of the week for his podcast. Average Gatsby, shout out to Simple Flip Effects. Side note, ever consider doing like guest stars discussions asking for a friend? Yep, we used to have, we've had a few, uh, as I mentioned, Ruxin was on this podcast, and we also, Deck Tech had it somehow finagled his way to get an interview with Timmy Chu, the first world champ, so... Yes, I am open to doing interviews here. Of course, it's kind of like figuring out when someone's available on Skype around the world type situation. And I have to set up my recorder for someone else again because I do a solo and I don't use the Skype recorder. So it's figuring out the technology, but it's nothing I can't handle, frankly. And Shiny Sophion, uh, I think she, she, um, she missed out on... Going to the world champs by one rank, I think. I forget what it was. But she's a, she's a very good player. It says hello or henlo. I'm, I don't know the difference there, but hello, Sophie. And the last tweet I want to talk about, Yu-Gi-Oh! Deck Talk, Doug Dimidul. So this was about this was about the skill lottery. <laughs> and we found out what the dual chips were for. And you, you, you could gamble your couple of stones and your 100 dual chips for getting a missing skill for your guy and he chose sartorius i ended up get he says and i end up getting draw sense spell or trap for sartorius pe- press f to pay respects fred bird 10 says i got that skill too the l game says i got that weird point life point 5000 thing J. Hairu Maru says oof. Tinger Wu says sad. I got I get Kaiba's uh, DSOD new skill. And Carl Mark 69. I'm not sure where you get the lottery coins. Yeah, I did the same exact thing with Sartorius because I don't have Master of Destiny. And I think I got a life point boost alpha or Ross and Stark. I forget which one I got, but I didn't. It was only two skills left and I lost my coin flip, so. And of course, we don't know how to get more of these coins yet. It's it sucks if they're going to make it pay to win. Um, like you can only get these things from buying twenty packs with money or something. Uh, that would suck. But uh, most people just spent those coins, those hundred dual chips, and we're waiting for the next ones to get our skills. Or you could skill farm hardcore, but who really wants to do that? I don't know. All right, let's get to the main content of the week, Dark Side of Dimensions World. We start off with three legendary duelists, and um, i trying to think about what's different here. I'll explain about the characters and um, 
what we're going to talk about here are the new cards that we get from leveling up and the, the, unique, the new or unique skills we get from the duelist. One thing I will not talk about this week is farmable cards. Every duelist here has farmable cards. And I'm going to save that for another week, basically. So let's start with Kaiba. This is the new Kaiba. Uh, I think everyone has re resorted to calling him Sexy Kaiba because he has pecs now. That's the only that's the main difference about this guy. And he has a dual arm built, I mean a dual disc built into his arm, and he wears a Bluetooth headset. And the, I think the Bluetooth headset is the funniest thing about him because it's not a Bluetooth headset. It's like a neural sensor of some sorts, but. I think that's the funniest thing about him because it always looks like he works at a hotline and he has a Bluetooth. Um, so it always looks like a guy who's on a hotline and, you know, whatever. But anyways, for Kaiba, and then new cards, Induced Explosion. We get three copies of this trap card. When a card you control is, nor is destroyed by a spell effect, except during the damage step, target one card your opponent controls, destroy it. During either player's turn, except the turn... This card was sent to the graveyard. When a card you control is destroyed by a spell effect, you can banish this card from your graveyard. Target one card your opponent controls, destroy it. So this could potentially be a card that destroys two cards. And you get to pick any card, which is great. The only problem I have with this card is when a card is destroyed by a spell effect. And that doesn't happen a lot anymore in this game. The most common card is... Double Cyclone or Galaxy Cyclone, and those are all Ancient Gear decks, it seems. Um, Cosmic Cyclone is the chosen way of back row. Hey, Trunate bounces, it doesn't destroy. And any monster effect or trap effect doesn't count, so you have to... Or maybe like Dark Magician, Dark Magic Attack, or Thousand Knives, I don't know, something like that. But it's not all too common right now for spell effects. It would be decent if there were. More spell effect destruction, I mean. Three copies of a quick play spell. Dragon's Fighting Spirit. Target one dragon monster you control that was special summoned this turn. For each monster your opponent con uh, currently controls that was special summoned, it gains one additional attack during each battle phase this turn. So this is a conditional kind of win more card. Um, Blue Eyes is a heavy special summon deck, though. They dispose... And then they bring themselves back really easily. Uh, Silver's Cry or um, the Stone or Snipe Hunter, they all kind of play into that. So it's not a huge stretch. It might see play because Dark Lords are usually all special summoned. And when they don't have beatdown, they all have below 3,000 attacks. So, or they have 3,000 attack or less. So it's pretty good um, to clear a board uh, against Dark Lords. You could just beat down your own guy, your blue eyes, and then you could just destroy three monsters, basically. Here's an interesting trap card, Counter Gate. When an opponent's monster declares a direct attack, negate the attack, and if you do draw a card, then if it's a monster, immediately after this effect resolves, you can normal summon it in face-up attack position. So we're never going to get negate attack. It's too good because it ends the battle phase. But this negates a, a direct attack, and... This kind of competes with Dimensional Prison. Dimensional Prison, you could banish their monster. This one, you draw one, and then you get a monster on the board. Um, this is decent with some sticky monsters, that, like an Amazon of Swordswoman or something that floats more monsters onto the board. It will be great if you could normal summon a really big monster, but I don't think they would let... That will be too strong, in my opinion. But this one might see some play in certain decks, I think. We get one copy of Crystal Avatar with a K. Continuous Trap Card. When an opponent's monster declares a direct attack, if its attack is greater than or equal to your life points, special summon this card in attack position as an effect monster, Warrior Light, with level 4 question mark attack, zero defense. That has attack equal to your life points. Then change the attack target to this card. If this card was special, is summoned this way, is destroyed by battle after damage calculation inflict damage to your opponent equal to its attack. 
So this is situational based on how much life points you have, obviously. But the threat of lethal exists in every game. And this could be devastating if your opponent's attack cannot be pulled back. Because they're forced to hit into this card and they lose the duel. This could be a really frustrating card. And it could be a card just because it's a one of. It's not too strong. But it could be a general OP trap card that anyone puts into their deck. And expect Cosmic Cyclone or other back row removal to see some play. If this card is put into every deck. Because it is a huge safety valve. It could turn your loss into your victory. So that type of card can be very dangerous but the good thing they limited it to one and being able to pull back that attack and say no um is what makes or breaks this card i think this card could be really good and the last new level up card from kaiba deep eyes white dragon level 10 dragon zero attack and defense when a face of blue eyes monster you control is destroyed by battle or an opponent's card effect and you have a dragon monster in your graveyard special summon this card from your hand if you do, inflict 600 damage to your opponent for each dragon monster with different names in your graveyard. If this card is normal or special summon, target one dragon monster in your graveyard. This card's attack becomes equal to that monster's. If this card on the field is destroyed by card effects, destroy all monsters your opponent controls. Very flashy with big effects, but it's too situational. You have to have a face-up, blue eyes destroyed. Um, you have to have a dragon in your graveyard. You have to special summon this from your hand. And then uh, a whole bunch of other stuff, but... It's too situational. Not a good card. Let's look at Kaiba's skills. Scorns of Ultimate Defeat can be used on turn 6 and onwards. Add one Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon to the top of your deck. In addition, add Chaos Form to your hand from outside the deck. If your opponent controls monsters with 35 or 100 or higher defense, the skill can only be used once per duel. So I looked up Chaos, uh, Blue, Eyes, Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon, and it has this ability with double double damage piercing, which is, you win the game, obviously. And that seemed OP. But what kills this skill, of course, is you can't get the Ritual spell if they don't have a 3,500 defender, and that seems really rare in my opinion. So um, you can't even use Concentrating Current to boost your monster, because that only works on your cards, so skill is never going to see play unless every deck starts running monsters with 3500 defense but I don't think that will happen ultimate dragons at the beginning of the duel add one blue eyes ultimate dragon and neo's uh, neo blue eyes ultimate dragon to your extra deck so blue eyes decks don't really rely on fusioning right now the competitive version at least and this adds two new fusion cards to the extra deck, basically. Um, I'm not sure if the, there's new fusion support in Invocation cards, but this doesn't really have a negative impact on a Blue Eyes deck, because they don't really use the extra deck except for the level 9 synchro play, but it doesn't. It just deprives the deck of beatdown using a skill like beatdown, which will help in the meta, so this probably won't see play either. Alternative Evolution. Select one monster you control with 3,000 or more attack, whose original name is Blue Eyes White Dragon. The selected monster becomes Blue Eyes Alternative White Dragon. The skill can be used once per duel. So you transform a Blue Eyes into Blue Eyes Alternative, and Blue Eyes Alternative has the same stats as Blue Eyes, but instead of attacking, you could use it to destroy one card each turn. So that's a very strong con control ability, and frankly better than Blue Eyes. So this one's interesting. Dragonic Rebirth can be used on turn 4 and onward. Add a dragon monster with the same level as the number of turns that have passed from your graveyard to your hand. This skill can be used once per duel. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it better. Like uh, Blue Eyes decks use Silver's Cry to get the monster already. This just adds it to your hand. I guess there's some play when you want to transform... Uh, Dragon Spirit of White into Blue Eyes White Dragon, but you have to wait four turns for that to happen anyway, so a little slow. Dragonic Reincarnation. Send one level 7 or higher Dragon type monster from your hand to the graveyard, then add one level 4 Light Dragon monster from your hand to uh, 
uh, to your hand from your graveyard. This skill can be used once per duel. There's only a, like a few level four like dragons: Dwarf Star Dragon, Planeteer, Mirage Dragon, Assault Wyvern. These cards, I don't know about Assault Wyvern, but the other cards I haven't really seen play in Duel Links. The Dwarf Star Dragon is a Chaos card, so that might be something that's interesting later on. Finally, Life Point Boost Omega, which every Duelist here has. Increase starting life points by 5,000, reduce hand size by 4 cards. So, you start off with 9,000 life points, and you start off with no cards. So, this probably won't see play, because you have no card advantage at all. You have negative card advantage. The only thing you think about with these skills is if Card of the Soul works for it, but when you have no cards in your hand, Card of the Soul gets infinitely worse. So, there you go. Alright, so next guy is Mokuba. You get Mokuba at level 6 or 7, I forget which one. And Mokuba has definitely cleaned up. He he lost a lot of his hair. He's, uh, he's looking sharp. Um, he's the vice president of Kaiba Corp. Yep. But he, he still has no storyline. He's just helping Kaiba. He doesn't have his own storyline, it seems. But what can you do? New cards... Uh, Gaia Kuteno Megami is a repeated card, actually. It's a Seto Kai card, but it's a filler. That's not worth mentioning. Magma Dragon is a new card. Level 4 Worm, 1600, 1200. When this card is special summoned, target one Worm Monster in your graveyard except for Magma Dragon special summon in defense mode. Its effects are negated. You can use this effect once per turn. You cannot special summon monsters to turn you activate this effect except for Worm Monsters. Very few worm monsters in Duel Links, but all of the Metaphys monsters are worm. They're eligible. But this card has poor synergy with them. They don't. They like to banish cards. They're probably not in the graveyard. And they want to use their big b abilities to blow up the board or do whatever. And this card will negate their abilities. So, anti-synergy worm for Metaphys. Here's the theme of Mokuba. They're the Thunder Dragons. They're kind of related to the discard Thunder Dragon, but they're a new archetype. The card is Thunder Dragon Roar. Level 6 Thunder Effect, 2400 Attack, 0 Defense. You can discard this card, add to your hand one of your Thunder Dragons that is banished or in your graveyard except for Thunder Dragon Roar. If this card is banished or sent from the field to the graveyard, Special summon one Thunder Dragon monster from your deck in defense mode, but return it to your hand during the end phase. You can use one effect of Thunder Dragon each turn, once per turn, and only once that turn. If you've played against Mokuba in DSOD World, he stalls forever. And it's because these cards just they recycle each other, they play each other from the deck. I'm not sure what use they have outside of stalling a ton, but they stall really, really well. I'm pretty sure I've decked out against Kaiba, I mean Mokuba, or I made him deck out. It was one of those situations where the duels goes on forever. Um, Ruins of the Divine Dragon Lords. Yeah, we're getting our third copy of that card, so it's not a new card. Here's a card we have a new copy of one only Thunder Dragons 100 Thunders. Trap card. Target one. Thunder monster in your graveyard, special summon it. Then you can special summon as many monsters with the name, same name as possible from your graveyard. The monsters special summoned by this effect are banished when they leave the field. Also, when they are face up on the field, you cannot special summon monsters except for thunder monsters. You can use one per turn. We only get one, anyways. Uh, still, yeah. They. This archetype stalls a ton. This is just a resurrection card. You get those monsters back. And then you banish them. And then you could just recycle them with the uh, Thunder Dragon Roar. Yeah. So, yeah. We'll get a full picture of this next week when we look at the other cards you can farm from Mokuba with Thunder Dragons to see how it all works together. Alright. Let's look at Mokuba's unique skills. Gem Dragon Go. If your deck contains three of the three or more of the monsters listed below, you will have improved chances of having a normal monster in your starting hand. And the monsters are Hyozen Ru, Luster Dragon 2, Luster Dragon, or Alexandrite Dragon. These are all normal monsters. 
The best one is Alexandrite Dragon because it's a uh, level four two thousand. Goes in ruse that uh, Bastion card to twenty one hundred twenty eight hundred, but it's two tributes. Luster Dragon is nineteen hundred four star. Luster Dragon two is two one tribute twenty four hundred. Anyway, they're all normal dragons. It's more of a fun skill when you're playing normal dragons or higher addicts. Higher addicts have synergy with normal monsters. But the thing that's curious to me is what is this improved chance? Like what percent is that? They don't really qual- they don't really say what that is. So it's more of a fun than good skill. Anyways, it, it always was that way. Decoy tactics can be used when your life points decrease by fifteen hundred. Play one decoy dragon from outside your deck in defense mode. You cannot special summon any other monsters during the turn you activate the skill. This skill will only activate if you begin the duel with a deck that has five or more dragon monsters with different names. It can only be used once. So, it gets a body on the board, and Decoy Dragon kind of does a combat trick where you switch the attack to another dragon you resurrect from the graveyard. But then you can't special summon any monsters that turn either, which kind of sucks. And you can only tribute summon the monster. So, in some deck where you're trying to finish a quest for tribute summoning or something, I don't know. But And you have to play a deck with five different dragons. That kind of muddles it up too. This is probably the best DSOD skill we have so far. You're powerless. Select one spell or trap card that your opponent controls that targets a monster you control. Negate the selected card until the end of the turn. This skill can be used once per duel. So it's basically a free counter trap that you get to use as a dual skill. Um, yeah, I wonder how they do this because dual skills are typically not quick effects, but this looks like it is a quick effect. There's no way you could just yeah, there's, you you have to select that spell or trap that targets, so it has to be a quick effect. I think this could see some play as a basically a counter trap skill. Um, next is see you later. Select one monster you control that you are the original owner of. Return the selected monster to the hand. It can be used once per duel. Okay, so monsters typically don't get stolen in duel links except for like Relinquished or Vampire Vamp, things like that. So this is best for bouncing your own monsters, like spirit monsters. That, um, like a mono, you want the ability when it's normal summoned. And defense charge. So one face of monster you control gains the current turn count times 100 defense until the end of the turn. This could be used once per duel. Not too useful because it doesn't seem like a quick play, unless it is a quick play. But um, you have to protect your own monster from destruction, and that's what defense is typically for anyways. Last character, which I still don't have and is unlockable by banishing 100 cards, is Scud. And apparently Scud isn't even a duelist, he's just... The face of bullying in 2019 or 2018, whenever the movie came out. And his new cards are kind of bad. Let's see. Baron of the Fiend Sword, 1500 Attack Fiend. Battle Footballer, uh, 4 Star, 1000, 2100 Defense. That's all it is. Um, You know, these defense cards they used to have, they used to restrict 2000 Defenders, and now there's a free 2100 defender and that's pretty much inconsequential it doesn't it doesn't stall very well anymore like it used to here's a new card mind golem level three rock uh, 1000 attack 1900 defense when this card is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard inflict 500 damage to your opponent very simple burn ability based on battle destruction it's a new burn tactic and you would like to bring this card back repeatedly Powerful Rebirth or Limiter Removal. Not Limiter Removal. Um, Limit Reverse. And Banishing Monsters is gaining traction, so, so, so this card could just be continually banished or destroyed by card effect. So you get around the burn ability, but this could be in play if burn decks come back in any way. And Continuous Trap Card, we get two copies of this card, Tyrant's Temper. Tribute one monster to activate this card. All face of monsters on the field that you own or are unaffected by other trap cards. This could be a card that sees side deck play. I think um, if traps become big again, um, 
Like, let's say, you know, people get too aggressive. I think Traps would come back. Um, this could get around cards like Wall of D or Dimensional Prison or Drowning Mirror Force, so it's not that bad. Um, hopefully the Tribute Cross doesn't make this card too slow, because that could happen, but there's a very good chance this card could see some play. Look at Scud's skills. Attack Charge, one face-up monster you control, gains the current turn count attack times 100 until the end of the turn. Gives your monster a little bit extra to get over your opponent's monster, but tie that bind and beat down are automatically better because you could do those every turn instead of once a duel. Extra pain when you deal battle damage to your opponent, deal an additional 50. This skill does not activate if your opponent has 1,000 or less life points. So Scud has a thing where he adds 50. Um, it's a gimmick. It doesn't, it's not going to make a difference in duel links. Life charge. Increase your life points by the current turn count times 200. It can only be used once. So Tristan has a better skill, I'm not done yet, which brings your life points to 2,000 automatically. Um, this could, this skill could let you use an extra Cosmic Cyclone for something, but Tristan's skill is pretty much superior to this one. Life point boost delta. Increase starting life points by 3,500. Reduce hand size by 3. So you start off with 7,500. Again, you're at a severe card disadvantage. Even though you might match up something for card of the soul, the card is worse because you don't really have it in the hand. And last skill, Smile Bright. At the beginning of your turn, your opponent takes 50 damage. This skill will not activate if your opponent has 100, 1,000 or less life points. Yeah, this is pretty bad. Um, unless burn decks can't do any better. I think they typically could do better with like a draw sense low level or something, but this is pretty bad. Next week, we're going to talk about, or some other episode, we're going to talk about the farmable rewards at the gate because there's too much to talk about this week. Let's move on to the new box, Dark Dimension. All right, let's talk about the URs for this box, which we only get one copy of each. Gladium Oracle Mahad, who is... You know, the Dark Magician in old times. Level 7 Spellcaster, 2500 attack, 2100 defense, light monster. When you draw this card, you can reveal it, special summon from your hand. If this card battles a Dark Monster, its attack is doubled during the damage step only. If this card is destroyed by battle or card effect, you can special summon one Dark Magician from your hand, deck, or graveyard. Very, just a bit busted. It's a free 2500 special summon. It could be 5,000 against Dark Monsters, which are very popular. And Vanish is super strong in this... It's going to be super strong in this meta, but this could make Dark Magician decks top tier, I think. Um, it's a boost to spellbooks as well. Um, it could also spawn other spellcaster decks. There's a lot of spellcasters in this box, and this is a card that could fit in many places. But it's more for the Dark Magician. And just the ability to get out a 5,000 attack monster is huge. You just win the game with one swing here. So, very, very good card. Here's a card that makes Dark Magician Girl look like Chopped Liver. Chocolate Magician Girl. Level 4 Spellcaster. 1,600, 1,000. Once per turn, you can discard one Spellcaster monster. Draw one card. Once per turn, when this card is targeted for an attack, you can target one spellcaster in your graveyard except Chocolate Magician Girl. Special summon it, change the attack target to it. If you do, the attacking monster's attack becomes half of its current attack. So this is a very good build around card, and I think it's a whole new archetype, the Magician Girl archetype. But this is, you dispose a monster, turn into card advantage. Uh, well, I mean, that's one for one, but then you reuse that monster... Resurrect it, and then you apply a mirror wall on it. So, this card is a battle phase you know, queen, basically. And it might just weaken battling overall. I think if this card becomes, you know, in a top-tier deck, everyone's going to try to banish or hard-remove cards. And that kind of gets into, you know, either effect, effect destruction or banish, or effect removal from a spell card that kind of ties into that Kaiba card with the induced explosions if there are more spell cards that destroy stuff 
to get rid of this chocolate magician girl. You might want to include induced explosions to counter that. So there's a bit of a cat and mouse there, but this is a super good card against the um, battling that's going on. Your opponent should know not to attack this card. And when you're playing against a chocolate magician girl, you should know not to attack her and get rid of her some other way. A super good card. Here's another very interesting card. A new archetype spawner. Alistair the Invoker, level 4, Dark Spellcaster, 1000 attack, 1800 defense. During either player's turn, you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard, target one fusion monster you control. It gains 1000 attack and defense until the end of the turn. If this card is normal summoned or flipped face up, you can add one invocation from your deck to your hand. Doesn't make a lot of sense right now, but let's talk about invocation, which is another UR. Normal spell. Fusion summon one fusion monster from your extra deck using monsters from your hand as fusion materials. If summoning an invoked fusion monster this way, you can also banish monsters from your field or either player's graveyard as fusion materials. If this card is in your graveyard, you can target one of your banished Alistair the Invoker. Shuffle this card into the deck. If you do add that card to your hand, you can use this effect once per turn. So there's three new fusion monsters here. Um, there's an earth one, there's a dark one, and there's a water one. And invocation lets you, it's a new way of fusioning summoning, but it's not its not like Neos fusion or red eyes fusion where you can use the deck monsters, but you could use graveyard monsters, and then you could use your opponents. So um, all of those invoked fusions involve Alistair the Invoker as a material or a random attribute. So earth... Arc and Water are the ones that they target here. And then you could use your opponents. You could banish your opponent's monsters to fill that Earth, Dark, or Water. And then you have Alistair, too. So, Alistair does everything in this deck. He is the fusion material. He is the tutor for invocation. Um, he is a combat trick um, to, to boost your monster. So, you need three of these. You need three three Alistairs and three Invocations if you're going to play that new fusion archetype. Next card is Element Saber Malehu, and this is also a new archetype. Level 4 Warrior Dark, 1900 attack, 0 defense. Once per turn, you can quick effect. Send one Element Saber from your deck, from your hand to the graveyard, target one face up monster on the field, change it to face down defense. Once per turn, if this card is in the graveyard, declare an attribute. This card's in the graveyard becomes an attribute until the end of the turn. What happens is you try to fill up your graveyard with these cards, and this card has a built-in quick effect Paleozoic Canadia without the monsters. So this is just really good disruption. It is a warrior though, so it it can't be like a light and dark spellcaster to fit into that, because that would be super good. But the goal is to dump monsters into the graveyard, change their attributes. We'll get into that later, but this quick effect Paleozo Kaneda is very solid. Thunder Dragonhawk. Level 6 Thunder, 1800, 2200. You can discard this card, special summon one of your Thunder Dragon monsters that is banished or in your graveyard except for Thunder Dragonhawk. If this card is banished or sent from the field to the graveyard, you can shuffle any number of cards from your hand to the deck, then draw the same number of cards. You can use this effect once and only once that turn. This is Mokuba's archetype uh, with the new Thunder Dragons. And this lets you reuse those banished monsters. So again, um, and this card also has an ability like Magical Mallet. So they stall really well. The full archetype price stall is super good too. So this is a key component to that. Chaos Sorcerer. So there's Chaos going on now. Level 6 Spellcaster, 2300 attack, 2000 defense. Cannot be normal summoned or set. Must be special summoned. From your hand by banishing one light and one dark from your graveyard. Once per turn, you can target one face of monster on the field, banish it. This card cannot attack the turn you activate this effect. Super good. Um, we've always had some you know weak chaos strategies in Duel Links, but you know there was that DLS t Evening Twilight card. There were um, you know chaos has always been around, but this is the one that puts it all together. And it opens up play for all your light and dark monsters, so try to... F there might be some new deck here. It immediately This card immediately has a spot in light and dark spell books because they automatically have light and darks. So, 
Spellbooks get a boost from Chaos Sorcerer, and of course this card banishes a card once per turn, with no cost pretty much. It has to be a face of monster, but not much of a cost. There's no cost. And, well the cost is you can't attack, I guess, but if you're banishing something, who needs to attack, right? Next card, Necro Valley, we've, we already have this card. Uh, field spell, all gravekeepers gain 500 attack and defense. Cards in the graveyard cannot be banished. Negate any card effect that would move a card f in the graveyard to a different place. Negate any card effect that changes types or attributes in the graveyard. So, this is a selection box card. But you definitely need three of these to play Necro, uh, to play gravekeepers. And they're heavily, they're the main archetype of this box, gravekeepers. Uh, deck, uh, Doug Dimidol will talk about Gravekeepers later on in his deck of the week, but this uh, prevents any movement in the graveyard, and that will kill Spurton decks like Blue Eyes, like getting cards, resurrecting cards, um, banishing them for effects like Neos Fusion, for example. This gets around a lot, so this is a meta killer here. And Necro Valley Throne, normal spell, activate one of these effects, add one Gravekeeper's monster from your deck to your hand, and then next effect, immediately after this effect resolves, normal summon one Gravekeeper's monster. You can only activate one per turn. This has really weird text, but you could, it seems like you could either tutor for a Gravekeeper, or you could normal summon one Gravekeeper, and it's kind of like double summon, I think. You get to play two. It seems like you could either ramp, you could ramp into a one tribute gravekeeper, I think. So that's what the goal is of Necro Valley Throne. This is a card you want three of, of course, because it's so flexible and has two very strong abilities. And to the SRs of the box now, which the difference, of course, is there's two copies of SRs, so it goes into how you reset the boxes if when you're shooting for your URs. First one is Karakuri Steel Shogun Model 00X Burrito, level 8 Earth Machine Synchro. Requires one tuner, one or more non tuner machines, 2800 attack, 1700 defense. When this card is synchro summoned, you can special summon one Karakuri monster from your deck. Once per turn, when the battle position of a face of Karakuri monster you control is changed, draw a card. So, the other Karakuri Shogun Bure is. 7 stars, 2600 I think. And it has the same ability where you can special summon a monster, but that one changes the battle positions of the monsters. This one is if the battle position changes, you draw a card. So, the tricky thing about Synchro Plays, obviously, is the math, and this is 8. But there is a card that helps it, and that's the Karakuri Watchdog, which is a level 4 tuner. So, there's some new math that you have to figure out there and also the new skills you play. But this trades the uh, position flipping aspect to a little more attack and some card advantage. It's not like Karakuri struggled with card advantage, but this makes the deck less reliant on that uh, continuous spell where you draw two cards. I forget what it's called, the scroll, the art of Karakuri or something, I forget. But it makes it less reliant if you have this strong beater who draws cards. Um, next card is it Invoked. Magella, Magellanica. Uh, level 8 Earth Rock Fusion requires Alistair the Invoker and one Earth Monster 3,000 uh, 3, attack, 3,300 3, defense. That's all it is. So this is just a beater. When you discard Alistair for his effect, you can get this to 4,000. That's the only appeal of this card. The other Invoked Monsters are more interesting. Intent Magician, level 12 Dark Spellcaster Fusion, Requires 5 spellcasters, 4,500 attack, 4,500 defense. Must be fusion summoned. If this card is fusion summoned by using 5 spellcasters with different names, you can destroy all cards your opponent controls. Cannot be tributed or used as fusion material. Also cannot be destroyed by card effects. This one is is on the uh, verge of meme territory, but then it could also be very dangerous. It could be very frustrating. You're going to need a special deck where you have a lot of 1 of spellcasters. And a lot of good card draw and hope your opponent doesn't chain the back row. So even if they chain the back row and flip this card, I guess the only card that could counter it is um, Floodgate because you can't get it back. But if you use Paleozoic Canadian, you can attack next turn. So there could be something here, but you need a special deck for it. And a lot of card draw, of course. Barry Magician Girl, level 1 Spellcaster, 400-400. 
When this card's normal summoned, add one magician girl from your deck to your hand. Once per turn, during either player's turn, when an opponent activates a card or effect that targets this card, or targets it for an attack, you can change this card's battle position. Special summon a magician girl, except for this one. Very useful card. You can get two magician girls from the deck. That's the goal of it. I don't think you really want it on the board, but it protects itself, so... Um, I mean, it gets destroyed. It's going to get attacked, but then you special summon a magician girl from your deck. Gravekeeper Spy, level 4, flip effect, um, 1200 attack, 2000 defense. Special summon one Gravekeeper's monster with 1500 or less attack from your deck. So most of them do have 1500 attack or less. And um, yeah, it's a good float card into your next plays. If some gadget here, uh, green gadget, red gadget, yellow gadget, they all do the same thing. Red gadget, you normal summon it or special summon, add yellow gadget to your hand. Uh, green gadget, you add red gadget, yellow gadget, you add green gadget. So they all do deck thinning. And then there's some synergy with some Gadgetron monsters we'll see later on in this box. Palace of the Elemental Lords. Spell card, all monsters you control gain attack and defense equal to the number of different attributes in your graveyard times 200. Once per turn, you can add one element saber from your deck to your hand, but skip the battle phase of your next turn. Once per turn, if an element saber monster in your hand or field would send a card from the hand to the graveyard to activate an effect, you can send that many element saber monsters from your deck to the graveyard instead. So if this archetype ever becomes a thing, this is the main card you need. There's a massive deck disposal here. You can boost your monsters pretty strong. And the element sabers, I don't know if they're primarily used for chaos strategies, but they seem to fit on their own field, when you can have five or six different attributes, you could count Divine as an attribute, and then boost your monsters really well. Wiseman's Chalice. Normal spell. If you control no monsters, select one monster in your opponent's graveyard, special summon it. During the end phase, give control of that special summon monster to your opponent. Monster cannot be attributed or used as synchro material. Um, I never really saw the point of this card except for clogging your opponent's monster zone with a card you don't want. It's a reprint card. Here's another reprint card. Network trap hole, trap card. When your opponent special summons a monster from the main deck or a graveyard, banish it face down. I always liked this card a lot. I always had one copy of this card. And I fitted it in when I was missing a trap card or something. It was pretty clutch against Ancient Gear Golem. Um, I mean, Ancient Gear Reactor Dragon that came from Gear Town. So you just banished it right away. I think this will see some play when... Um, Special summoning from the main deck and graveyard just happens all the time. It's going to be some side deck um, piece. So that is it for now with Dark Dimension. Next week, we're going to go into the archetypes. There's a ton of Gravekeeper support here. There's Magician Girls. There's the Invoked. Uh, Karkuris. Gadgetrons. Element Sabers. There's going to be a lot to talk about here. And also some other cards. There's a new Celtic Guardian here. It's amazing. So we're, next week we're going to go over the notable R's and N's and the archetypes, of course. Move on to the last of the new cards that Konami has thrown at us. That is the new structure deck EX, Master of Chaos. Alright, so the first card is a Magician of Chaos, level 7 Spellcaster Ritual, 2500 attack, 2100 defense. You can Ritual summon this card with Chaos form. This card's name becomes Dark Magician when it's on the field or in the graveyard. Once per turn, when a spell or trap card or its effect is activated, quick effect, target one card in the field, destroy it. If this ritual summon card is destroyed by battle or card effect, you can special summon one Chaos or a Black Luster Soldier ritual monster from your hand, except for Magician of Chaos, ignoring its summoning conditions. This kind of combines Dark Magician and Chaos strategies. It's a very complicated tree where everything falls in Chaos. There's definitely... Lackluster soldier things going on in chaos and dark. This adds to dark magician. So you have the benefit of using all the dark magician synergy cards. Um, obviously, you can't magicians navigation this, but um, all the other spell cards you can use, and um, maybe even dark magic inheritance. Um, there's a quick effect ability to destroy something that might limit what your opponent does, but it's not better than Shen's ability Shen. Straight up negates the ability. This will just let you clear something on the board. 
when this card gets destroyed, you get to recoup a monster. That's a little situational because you have to have that card in your hand. Advanced Ritual Art, Ritual Spell. This card can be used to ritual summon any ritual monster. You must also send normal monsters from your deck to your graveyard whose total levels equal that level of that ritual monster. This is a universal ritual spell, and I think it's a game changer because um, it, built, it changes the way all the decks are built. Cyber Angel um, Ritual Spells and Vendred Ritual Spells provide protection in the graveyard, but... Um, this doesn't do that, but it's like Neos Fusion. It lets you use cards from the deck. And this is super... This, this helps you a lot. And it also, because it requires normal monsters to be the material, I think this will lead packages again. So there might be like a Blue Eyes package, or a Red Eyes package, or a Neos package. Uh, it may be even a Dark Magician package, because they're all normal monsters. And you just use them as material to get out your ritual spells, your ritual monsters. But then again, you lose that you lose that protection or whatever Vendred rituals do, they have a purpose, so you lose that. Dark Cavalry is a fusion card, level 8, Dark Magician plus a Warrior, 2800 attack, 2300 defense, gains 100 attack for each spell or trap on the field and in the graveyards. If this card uh, inflicts piercing, when a card or effect is activated that targets a card on the field, you can quick effect the card or card negate that activation if you do destroy that card. So this is this could lead more hybrid decks because this requires Dark Magician and Warrior, so it kind of leads to the hybrid. Negate effect is super solid. It is like um it does hit the target, so like Paleozoic Canadian Econ. And also many any like monster effects that target too, so it's a better version of Shia N's ability, I think. Arisen, Gaia, the Fierce Knight, level 7 warrior, 2300 attack, 2100 defense. If your opponent controls more monsters than you do, you can normal summon this card without tributing. If this card is tributed, special summon one Black Luster Soldier monster from your hand or graveyard. You can only use this effect once per turn. When you ritual summon a Black Luster Soldier monster, you can banish this card from the graveyard as one of the monsters required for the ritual summon. Very situational card here. It can be normal summoned as a 7 star 2300 monster. It's a lot of attack and a lot of stars, which helps for synchro plays and ritual plays too. Um, it's only a synergy with Black Luster Soldiers. So that's the only use it has for the Chaos Equation. I think this card's on the outside looking in in any of those things. Um, Keeper of Dragon Magic. Level 4 Dragon, 1800 attack, 1300 defense, Dark Monster. If this card is normal or special summoned, you can discard one card, add polymerization or fusion normal spell from your deck to your hand. You can reveal one fusion monster in your extra deck special summon, one of the fusion materials whose name is specifically listed on that card from your graveyard in face down defense position. You can only use each effect once per turn. You cannot special summon monsters from the extra deck except for fusion monsters. The turn you activate either of this card's effects. Very good card. Um, you could kind of just discard the card you want, which is the material, tutor, polymerization, or a fusion card, and then you special summon that card you just threw away onto the field, and then you can fuse. So this is pretty awesome for a dragon fusion. You could, you could, you don't have to use this Keeper of Dragon Magic as the material. You could have something in your hand, obviously. So super strong card for dragon fusions. And finally, Chaos Form, Ritual Spell. Um, this card can be used to Ritual Summon any Chaos or Black Luster Soldier Ritual Monster. You must tribute monsters from your hand or banish Hand or Field and banish Blue Eyes or Dark Magicians from your graveyard as the things. They must be exactly equal. So yeah, this is the Ritual Spell for Magician of Chaos and some other monsters too. It wasn't Blue Eyes and Dark Magician in the mix, so Chaos... Chaos strategies are very layered and complex. So that is it for that box. Um, obviously, with so many new cards, it's hard finding gems. So make sure you do that survey of theirs. They had this survey where you get 50 gems. And there's also a lot of stuff to stage up, level up, gameplay, um, dual trials, all these things. Take it slow. Make sure you get all your gems. 
and I'm just trying to stage up myself while trying to unlock Scud and also rank up all my characters. So there's a lot of auto dueling going on in this world. So Doug Dimidul is here. He has Grave Keepers. This is years in the making. Grave Keepers were some of the first cards. It was pretty much the first competitive deck I played. I think I had a stupid build, but now we have all the cards, or I think most of them. And Doug Dimidul combines some of the newest cards from the new box with some of the old ones. So check them out right now for an idea how to play Grave Keepers. Hey there, this is Doug Nimadul with Doug's Casual Deck of the Week. So this week, I'm running with the Gravekeeper's deck, because, you know, the new box just came out. I was always a huge, huge fan of Gravekeepers. So, uh, without further ado, I wanted to utilize a lot of the newer cards, but also kind of throw back to some of the uh, drops that we've had that are actually serving a lot more purpose and a lot better use this go-around. So, uh, let me start going into some of these. So the first one we have here is... a. Uh, just really the game changer and I want to start with the extra deck. The extra deck is going to include Gravekeeper's Supernaturalist. This is a level 7 fusion monster that just requires two Gravekeeper's monsters. It also gains attack or defense equal to the combined original levels of the materials used for its fusion summon times 100. While Necro Valley's on the field, this card and any other card in your field zone cannot be destroyed by card effects. Also during your main phase you can activate this effect. During the end phase of this turn add one Gravekeeper's monster or one Necro Valley card from your deck to your hand. You can only use this effect once per turn. So really, the goal is to try and get Gravekeeper, Supernaturalist, and Necro Valley out as soon as possible. It is such a good combo. Now I understand people are sending cards back to the hand, shuffling stuff back into the deck, and banishing. So that's not really offering full protection here. But as far as those decks that revolve, that revolve around popping cards and stuff... You know, this is just a really, really good fusion monster and very easy to get out, especially thanks to Grave uh, Gravekeeper's Spiritualist. So what I do in this deck is I run three copies of Gravekeeper's Spiritualist. This is your alternative to polymerization, so it's my workaround from having to deal with six samurais trying to negate my fusion plays. So what Gravekeeper Spiritualist does is during your main during your main phase of Necro Valley is on the field, you can fusion summon one spellcaster type fusion monster from your extra deck using this card you control and other monsters from your hand or field as fusion material. You can only use this effect of Gravekeeper Spiritualist once per turn. So this is just absolutely bonkers. It's so easy to get fusion plays going now. As long as you have at least one other uh, Gravekeeper's monster on the field or in your hand, you can immediately go into your Gravekeeper Supernaturalist as long as you have Necro Valley in play. So what's your workaround if you don't get lucky and don't have Necro Valley? Well, what I have is Gravekeeper's Priestess. As you remember, this is one of those unlockable cards or that, that you get from drops when going against uh, Ishizu. So Gravekeeper's Priestess, if you don't remember, because this is a pretty old card that's been around in the game since near the beginning, it's a level 3 spellcaster with only 1,000 attack and 1,500 defense. While there is no face-up field spell card, the field is treated as Necro Valley. All Gravekeeper's monsters gain 200 attack and defense. So as long as you could have Gravekeeper's Priestess on the field, Hopefully you could get Gravekeeper Spiritualist on the field and then go into your fusion play. So that's really what you want to go for. And how do we get uh, at least the appropriate cards in play or on the field at the same time? That's through Necro Valley Throne. This is the new UR from the new box set. And this thing is phenomenal. It's a searcher and it allows you to summon two Gravekeeper's monsters in the same turn. Uh, it's only going to be one or the other, though, so that's the one caveat. So activate one of these effects. First one is add one Gravekeeper's monster from your deck to your hand, and the second one, immediately after this effect resolves, normal summon one Gravekeeper's monster. You can only, you can only activate one Necro Valley Throne per turn. This card is so, so good. It allows you to search out what you need, or it allows you to get those plays going in case you want to get into a Gravekeeper's Oracle Tribute play, or Gravekeeper's Visionary Tribute 
Magic play, you could also do that. But honestly, what you're really trying to go for is the Fusion play. So if you can, also get your three copies of Necro Valley. You want to try and have this card as soon as possible, so increase your odds. Really load up your deck with copies of Necro Valley. The one card that is the real, real, real MVP, and if you get this combo turn one, you are set for the most part. And that's Hidden Temples of the Necro Valley. This is, a, I believe it's a drop card or something like that uh, from Ishizu or from uh, Odeon. I can't remember which one. But you activate only if both the Gravekeeper's Monster and Necro Valley are on the field. Neither player can special summon monsters except Gravekeeper's Monsters. If either Gravekeeper's Monster or Necro Valley is not on the field, destroy this card. So effectively, you can get a nice board lock turn one just from having uh, a, a Necro Valley on the field and having a Gravekeeper's Monster. It is a really, really, really good combo to have. And a lot of decks are driven around fusion plays or synchro plays or you're trying to special summon. It's game over at that point. I've had a few people scoop because turn one, I have Necro Valley on the field, and I have a Gravekeeper's Monster on the field with this card. If you open up with just a God Hand like that, it's going to be hard-pressed for your opponent to try and do anything unless they have some kind of back row removal spell card, such as Cosmic Cyclone, where they could banish something or, or whatever. So, honestly, I mean, this is your ultimate hand. So, how do I make sure that I get my... Um, my Gravekeeper's Priestess on to the field as quickly as possible. Well, I run three copies of Gravekeeper's Recruiter. Gravekeeper's Recruiter, uh, when this card you control is sent to your graveyard, add one Gravekeeper's Monster with 1,500 or less defense from your deck to your hand. So you really want to try and get this out there. It's also through Tribute as well that you're able to search out a card, so it works out very, very nicely. Other than that, one of the new super rares in the current box is Gravekeeper's Spy, level 4 spellcaster with 2,000 defense, which is extremely helpful. When this card is flipped, special summon one Gravekeeper's Monster with 1,500 or less attack from your deck. So you're able to then hopefully get into your Priestess play, or maybe get into your Gravekeeper Supernaturalist. So the next turn, it really sets you up nicely. After that, I just run a copy of Gravekeeper's Visionary and one copy of Gravekeeper's Oracle in case I'm trying to search them out and get just a classic play going. So overall, that's what this deck is made up of. There's a lot of different skills you could use. I would recommend Beatdown if you can or something along those lines. It's just overall just a lot of fun to play, and it's been shutting a lot of people down in ranked duels. So anyway, that's it for this week's um, Doug's Casual Deck of the Week, and I will see you next time. Take care. Thanks, Doug. And you can check him out on this podcast every week with his deck of the week and also on Twitter, Yu-Gi-Oh! Deck Talk. Finally, I'm going to talk about some upcoming news. Dual Quest and the Unknown Duel is coming later this month. Uh, Kapakapu Raid Duels are back. Infernity Force and a new Kaelin Kessler skill. Mission Circuit's back with Horse of the Floral Knights. Ubel event. This is the thing they talked about. You get to reacquire Jade and Ubel if you don't have them. Her and then new cards and skills. Loomis and Umbra are getting retired to the gate mid October. Dual Quest is back mid October. New event Turbo Dual Grand Prix late October. Unleash the True Power. This is a Weevil event. New cards Insector Firefly and Insector Giga Weevil. So, um, boost to an archetype that wasn't really played much. And finally, updates for October. They say April. I think that's a mistake, but let's see if we get these updates in October. You can check the list during your opponent's turn, which is something I asked for on the survey, which means you could check your graveyards, banish cards, and also your extra deck during your opponent's turn, or check theirs. And also you can check skill details via, via the dual log, so whenever skills are activated, you can check them out. So that is it for this big week in the dual world. Um, yeah, let me know how I'm doing on Twitter. You could Send me a tweet, dual underscore assessment. Join in all the discussion. We had a lot of good discussion this week. Um, the podcast uh, notes are all on WordPress, so the dual assessment.wordpress.com. We have complete notes there. And you can find this podcast anywhere. Just search the dual assessment. So next week, we're going to cover up what we didn't cover up this week. So it's basically, you know, the farmable cards. Hopefully, I'll have Scud by then, so we'll know that. And also, finishing the 
Dark Dimension box, along with other news that comes up. Probably the unknown duelist. So thanks for listening, everyone. Enjoy DSOD World. I'll see you then.